Uh, hi, good afternoon everyone. Today is April 6th, 2017. This is our community conference call. Rajiv S. Khanna from immigration.com, the law offices of Rajiv S. Khanna PC. I'll start first with the questions that have been posted uh, and I consider them to be frequently asked questions. So let me run through the frequently asked questions. I doubt very much I'm going to have time for new questions, but of course, we'll deal with posted questions and their follow-ups. Okay, the first question is about I-140. So the question is, can a revoked I-140 help for H4EAD? The answer is depends. If the I-140 was revoked on January 17th or after that this year, 2017, and it stayed approved for 180 days, that revoked I-140 can be used to get or extend an H-4 EAD. Once again, conditions are I-140 was revoked on or after January 17th, 2017. It stayed approved for 180 days, not after January 17th, up to the point of January 17th. Government has said they will extend the benefit of H-4 EAD extension to those types of I-140s even if they are revoked, extension or a new H-4 EAD. Now, one more thing to consider is this. For an H-4 EAD to be applied or extended, it is not necessary that you must have a particular I-140. Any I-140, so if you had two or three I-140s approved, two are revoked and one is still unrevoked, you can use that. Press star five if you have a follow-up question on this. Star five if you have a follow-up question, nothing new. Okay, all right, here we go. Let's, uh, this is from New York. New York, go ahead, please. Um, hi, uh, Rajiv, this is Divya. Yes, uh, I want to ask uh, one thing which you mentioned about uh, any I-140 set. Yes, so let's say if my current company has uh, applied for I-140, it is approved. Yes. And my previous employer, mm -hmm. they also filed for I-140 and it was approved. So will it qualify as the two I-140? Yes. You mentioned? Yes. You can okay. use, you just need one I-140 approval. So I'm not wishing that for you. But let's say for some reason, this I-140 gets revoked but the old one is still in play, that can be used for H-4 EAD. Or if the old one gets revoked and the new one is still around, that can be used. Now, if the old one has been approved for 180 days on January 17th, then there is no fear at all. Even if the other, any, if all the I-140s are revoked, you can still use the revoked I-140, which was pending for 180 days after approval on January 17th. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next frequently asked question. So this one is from um, RP416 Canada, changing from adjustment of status to consular processing for green card. Guys, I just wanted to point out one thing. It's very easy to convert from consular processing to adjustment of status. You just file the adjustment of status. But converting from adjustment, to st adjustment of status to consular processing requires an additional processing form I-824, which request, requests the USCIS to forward the file to consular processing, which starts by transferring the file to NBC. National Visa Center in New Hampshire. So the question here is this. I have an approved I-140 pending 485. There's a very large backlog. I want to go to Canada and stay there. 
I'm hoping you watched other, our other videos and our frequently asked questions uh, in the last few weeks that explain to you uh, how does this work when you move while your green card is pending. How to switch to adjustment of status from adjustment to counselor I-824. How long would it take? Maybe eight, nine months. The last time I checked, I could be wrong. Just check the times of I-824. How to inform USCIS, my citizenship has changed to Canadian. It, it becomes a part of the process. It's not that much of a big deal. We've had cases in which green card was approved. The person was outside the country. Then they changed to Canadian citizenship. Still no problem. So I don't think that is a big deal. Don't worry too much about that. That will be included in the part of the process. When you go to NVC, certain papers will arrive. Fill the papers out, making it clear which your country of citizenship is. So that's not a real issue. Star five, if there are any questions that are follow-ups on these issues that I discussed. Star five. Folks, some of you who are just joining, I may not have time for new questions, but of course, we'll have time for all the posted questions and their follow-ups. Next, next, let's go on to the next frequently asked question. If H-1 transfer is denied, can I rejoin my old employer? The answer is almost certainly yes. So, yeah, so the question here is, because there is no premium processing, I want to go from employer A to employer B using AC-21 portability. If for some reason the portability doesn't succeed, my second case is denied six months later, now I have been working for employer B for six, six months, can I switch back to employer A if they have not revoked my H1? And this question was answered in the affirmative by USCIS. They said, yes, you can. In one of the memos or one of the meetings with American Immigration Lawyers Association, they had raised this issue and answered it saying, yes, you can go back and join because according to USCIS, when you're working under AC-21, you're not out of status. You are in fact working according to the law. So you should be able to join back. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, no new questions, please. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. This one is, let's see, this one is from California. Okay, let's go to California first, then we'll go to New Jersey. California, go ahead, please. Raj, this is Raj here. Um, so in, on this case, uh, if, let's say, uh, the transfer gets approved, can I still work with the old employer if I'm with the new employer? Yes, sir, because this is, this is quite well settled. This is not new law. The way this works is a new approval does not revoke or overrule an existing approval. So for example, let's say you were working with employer A on H1 and employer B, C and D did their H1 transfers. B, C, D and B and C and D, their transfers are complete. Can you still continue working with A? Of course, because any number of subsequent approvals do not overrule or amend an existing approval. Also remember, this is the immigration perspective. From contract perspective, make sure you have not signed anything that could hurt you in terms of um, a lawsuit or something for costs. I, I have written a right. couple of articles on this. If you go to our website and look at the very top, immigration.com mm -hmm. on top, there is something called about us. In about us, there is one of the entries is articles written by Rajiv. And I have two articles on this. One is a short opinion piece for a newspaper, for a legal newspaper that actually describes to you how certain kind of payments employers should not try to recover them because they are their normal business expenses. So, but, but remember this, contract issues are separate. Immigration law wise, Subsequent approvals have no effect on existing approval. Okay? Right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's go to... 
This is New New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey, go ahead, please. Yes, so, so the same case, the uh, project A mm -hmm. has been approved. Mm -hmm. uh, now they move to the project B. Okay. During the project B, got terminated after two months. So the person has moved to the project A again, which is now considered as a project it shouldn't be transferred because she uh, moved out from project A to project B, right? That was the one that should be transferred. Mm -hmm. And that was not done in a premium case. It was done in a regular, so just on the receipt. She she moved back to the original employer, uh -huh. but original employer has to, they should be transferred because it's the uh, original employer has sent the uh, notice to revoke this existing petition. Mm -hmm. And now the result came out that B got approved without I-94 and okay. when she got back to A, that got denied. So what is the next step for the, for the benefit? Uh, a, a visa stamping will be needed because it appears that in all this withdrawal and revocation, somewhere along the line, she must have lost status. And maybe that status case was not addressed and See, because if I were to address this, I would have brought this up. And again, maybe you guys didn't know about it or the lawyers didn't know about it. But I would have brought it up that under the new regulations, I am allowed to seek the government's indulgence for up to 60 days grace period. And I would say that this was all a matter of unfortunate circumstances beyond the control of the employee. So please give us status within the United States. They may or may not, but under the circumstances you have described, Make sure there's no unlawful presence issue. And if there is not, send them out for getting visa stamping. I know it's going to be difficult. Visa stamping is always questionable, but I don't see any other choice. But the case is denied. So when, what is the visa stamp which she can go for? Don't, didn't you say that the second case was approved without I-94? Yeah, second case, with the previous employer got approved. She left that. That case. So uh, she doesn't want. If she doesn't want to go back, she's got to get an approval for from the second employer or a third or a fourth employer. Okay. okay. And and now uh, one question in the same way. Now H one B amendment has been filed for the new location, but that project did not go through or that project got terminated. So uh, uh, and when we re revoke the amendment, the original H one B gets denied. So what will be the consequences on that side? Uh, I asked that question. Last time you answered it, the H-1B amendment can be uh, taken back. So I wrote the letter to uh, took the H-1B amendment back. But they have denied the original petition. They have not denied the amendment yet, but they have denied the original petition. Okay, this, this is a fairly lengthy set of circumstances which I'm not going to be able to address in a five-minute telephone call. So I, I don't really know what exactly is going on. I will have to know a lot more about it. But I can give you a generic answer. The generic answer is this. When you have a bunch of petitions pending, whether it is two or three or four, each one may depend upon an approval of the prior case, like a daisy chain or like a domino. If you are within the limits of the first status, let's say your I-94 is expiring in August and you filed an amendment in June, which is before August, and you filed a transfer in July, it all depends upon how far, or let's rephrase that, it all depends upon whether or not I get approvals or denials before August. See, if I get denials before August, my petition is still good till August, I'm working, I'm okay. But when I start changing jobs and the petitions in the chain start getting denied, if my status depends upon a prior approval and the prior approval is not given, I won't get status, I won't get I-94. I can generically answer that question, okay? Okay, I would like to have a follow-up call with you. And, uh, yeah, why don't you just send me, send me an email to help at immigration.com and let me see if we can get this wrapped up for you in a few minutes. Okay. Good luck, sir. Bye bye. Okay, getting back to the next frequently asked question. Again, a lot of people have just logged in. 
I want to alert you folks that I have enough questions for today. I will not be able to do new questions. We'll just do posted questions and their follow-ups. Changing from H2, H1 to F1 and back to H1, that's not a problem at all. Normally, if you have an H1 going and you want to change, and by the way, I did I combine these two questions? No, this is not the one. I had uh, a couple of places where I combined questions because they were related. So can you go from H1 to F1 and back to H1? Sure. And you will not be subject to the quota because you become subject to the quota if you've been outside USA physically for one year or six years have passed since the last approval. So going from H1 to F1 and back to H1, reclaiming whatever is remaining on your H1 should not be a problem. Let's see the question. Sandeepan Bhattacharya says, my H1 is going to end in 2019. Is it legal to change to F1 after that? Yes. Can I again start a new H1B? Now, uh, Sandeepanji, in order for you to reset the H1 clock, converting to F1 and staying within USA is not good enough. You have to be physically outside the United States for one year. Otherwise, the clock does not get reset. Okay. Star 5, if you have a question, which is a follow-up on this, star 5, no few new questions, press star 5 on your telephone, star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Okay. And this is from Rahul 11J about change of job description, job location on PERM and I-140. You know that PERM is based upon a specific location. What that location is can be very interesting in consulting positions because consulting positions could involve a project that is available in Massachusetts for three months, then you've got to move to New York for six months, then you've got to move to California for a year. In those cases, do we have to start the green card all over again every time you move? And the answer is no, because it is allowed for us to file through corporate headquarters in jobs where relocation is possible. So it depends upon how the perm is drafted. If you are moved, but you intend to move back upon receipt of the green card, you can proceed along those lines also. So let's say that you are working in New York, but temporarily, during the process, the employer moves you to California for one year, two years, or even three years. The fact that you intend to move back to New York, the original location of the filing, can be another basis for continuing with the green card. And interestingly enough, once 485 is filed and 180 days have passed, you actually don't have to go back. That's what the AC21 allows you to do. Just take Maybe I'm going beyond the question, but just to make you aware of these things. So Rahul says, I'm working with employer A, employer, and the place of employment is the end client. Palm and I-140 are approved. If I have to move to a different client, is that a problem? Different job title, different job, job description. Job title, job description are different things. They are different things altogether. As well as location is concerned, that depends upon how the perm is drafted. If there's a complete change in job description, job um, title, it still is okay if you intend to come back to the old title once the green card is approved. See how the location and the title job description is for the future job and interim you can be changing things around, but it's gotta be within common sense and in good faith. It's gotta be honest. It shouldn't be that your job is filed as a junior programmer and you've been promoted to vice president and you say that from VP operations, I'll go back and take a job as a programmer. That becomes a little difficult to swallow. So you just make sure that you've discussed it with your lawyers. But that certainly is a possibility if it's a future job. That's what we consider it to be. So do I need to file PERM again, I-140 again? Is there any language permitted such as relocation? Yes, of course. These kind of, this kind of language we put all the time in the PERM app. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Star five, there is one. Ah, oh, Rahul, you are here, okay. Go ahead, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Yes, 
so my question is uh, I mean basically I talked to my uh, immigration attorney uh, well actually my HR department in this case and uh, they said that uh, in my case uh, the firm will have to be filed again because when the uh, NCA was filed the first time, you know, for the first client, uh, that was basically the, what you say, the, sir, the employment, the, the prevailing wage determination was then based on the first location. But now since the location is probably going to be different, According to them, that whole thing has to be done again because now it's a hang on, hang on, hang on one second. Two things are obvious. One, you're not talking to lawyers. And two, there's a lot of confusion. Prevailing wages is an effect, not the cause why you have to file the case again. Prevailing wages okay. are the cart, they are not the horse. Let me give you an example. Let's say you filed the first labor certification from New York and now you have been moved to San Francisco. The wages are exactly the same. Can you just use the same firm? No, you cannot. It is not connected to the prevailing wage. It is connected to the geographical location. Okay. So the explanation itself tells me that there's a lot of confusion about how this process works. For heaven's sake, don't just refile. Take advice of your counsel. Tell them if they have corporate counsel to reach out, talk with an immigration lawyer, show them the papers, and see what the options are. You may not have to file again. Okay. 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 Okay, but then the, right, but the first term has to be specifically filed at the headquarters, and there should be some English square that says, okay, there could be a possible relocation and only then no. all of these conditions no. have to be fulfilled, no. right? No, no. Rahul, I said there were two ways you could do this. One is through the relocation clause in the PERM application. Okay. In the PERM application. Or the second is through the intent to return to that location upon receipt of the vehicle. Okay. Okay. See my point? Okay, because in my case, right, right. In my case, actually, the second uh, condition is not going to be added. Right? Okay, well, think it through. Well, the thing is, the good news is, once your I-140 is approved, and right away the priority date is yours. Second, if it says right. approved for 180 days, the right to extend your H-1 repeatedly through any employer is yours too, even if the I-140 is revoked. Okay. Right. That is true. So, not, no harm done. I mean, it's not like the end of the world. If you have to refile it, fine, no problem. Okay. 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 Good luck. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too, sir. Bye bye. Okay. Let's go on to this is a this is a very important one. The next one that's coming up, which is about fraud or misrepresentation finding in visa or petition. Guys, be very careful with this. Very very careful because what happens is, if a fraud finding is made against you, that oh you committed fraud or you committed misrepresentation either during the processing of a visa outside in the U.S. consulate or during the adjudication of a petition, say you file for a transfer from one employer to another. I'm actually dealing with a case right now. We are preparing a response because the company they have said has committed fraud and they haven't. There's a very good explanation for, for what's going on. If the company gets uh, held to fraud, they will be targeted time and time again. They, they'll have all kinds of difficulties. If an employee is targeted or held to have committed fraud or misrepresentation, it's a permanent bar from entering USA. Some kind of waivers are available, very, very limited, very inefficient, very ineffective waivers. But basically, it's a permanent bar. So you've got to take this very, very seriously. If you have any kind of a misrepresentation or fraud implication being raised against you, deal with it very aggressively. Okay. Here is a question from Ash15. He went for H1 processing, visa processing. They held it in admin processing. They contacted the client, rejected it, and then they held him to 212A6C1, which is fraud. So 
Immigration Nationality Act Section 212A61C, uh, I'm sorry, A6C1 is fraud. Will I be, ever be able to enter USA? Yes, if you can get a 212D3 waiver for limited time or limited purposes. How to remove this fraud charge? This is a very interesting situation. I have dealt with, in the past two years, three cases like this. Uh, and we have been, well, let me, three successful cases and three pending. So we've dealt with this issue in many different ways. And what has happened is, in many of these cases, we found out that government has not thought this thing through. Sometimes what happens is, we investigate, and this can take years. It can take six months, year, two years, three years to resolve. But you've got to keep going at it because this is such a serious matter. In, a, in one of the cases, when we went to the counselor and we said, well, why are you holding him to fraud? There's no fraud. We looked at the paperwork. We are lawyers. We know what's going on. I don't see any fraud. Can you tell us where the fraud is? After much knocking about, we found out that consulate thinks that in one of the entries our client had, he had made some misrepresentations. So the fraud finding was made by CBP. So we went to Customs and Border Protection. We said, well, where is the fraud? Give us the papers. Turns out CBP did deny him entry for a different reason, but never made a fraud finding. So then we went back to the consulate and we said, wait a minute, there is no fraud. Where is the fraud? CBP is saying we don't have a fraud finding. Show us where your, where your uh, justification for fraud is. Ultimately, after months upon months upon months, one of these cases we are still fighting. Um, the other cases we were able to clear. Three of them, um, quite, you know, it was, it took time, but we were able to get them cleared up. So make sure that really this is not an issue of fraud. So get a lawyer, get them to chase it. Don't expect immediate results. If you're lucky, you might get this resolved within a few months, but it could take years. There is a waiver called 212 D as in doctor three, number three. 212 D3 waiver, you can look into that as well. I have a B1, B2 for 10 years, but the passport got lost in USA. You've got a new passport. Uh, how can I get duplicate B1, B2 reissued? Basically, when you change passport, you just have to go get a new B1, B2 stamping done. It won't be reissued. There's no such process. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this. Star 5, no new questions. Star five. Folks, those who have just joined us, I won't have time for new questions today. Sorry about that. Just dealing with old questions, posted questions, and their follow-ups. Uh, let's go to Illinois. Illinois, go ahead, your question. Uh, yeah, Rajiv. Rajiv, actually, so how can I, I be know uh, I, I actually, I, I'm sure I'm going to be discussing with you in detail about this. Um, maybe later on, but like right now I just want to ask like how can I be sure that those fraud charges, they were uh, for me or they, they were for the company, how can I be so sure uh, about that, can I uh, differentiate because I got that letter, so I'm not sure whether, because the company to which I applied, they are not in a very good terms with the immigration too, so it could be the company too, it could be a possibility, so how can I be so sure whether those fraud charges, they were for me or they were for the company, yeah. Easiest way for you, you have to apply for B1, yeah. B2 visa anyway. Go apply. If you have yeah. a fraud charge, they yeah. won't give it to you. If you don't have a fraud charge, yeah. they will deny it, if at all, on different grounds, not on 212AC6C1 ground. So that's the easiest way to find out, quickest way to find out. Oh, all right. I would, I, I would do that. But this is the thing. I, I was actually living in the U.S. for 12 years. I was a student. And um, first, I've done my beat, uh, MS from there. Then I was uh, in U.S. for so many years. And it's just like I, um, I had some bad time last year and I need to change my employer. And, and I was never denied a visa stamping when I was on it for throughout uh, so for so many years. Well, that, uh, that, all, that is, with all, all that is good for you, but it is not directly relevant. What is most important is was there or was there not a fraud finding against you personally in that visa proceeding? And the answer is apply yeah. for B1, B2, you'll find out right away. Okay? 
And if, okay. if there uh, isn't, so how, there isn't how, 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 hang on. If there isn't, you don't need to contact us. You are good to go. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you repeat it? I said, if there is no fraud finding against you, then you don't have to contact us. Yeah. You are good to go. Um, so, okay, I will, I will do. So, I'm currently in India right now. So, I'm, I'm, I think what, what you are advising is to go and ask them to form a D1, D2. Is that true? That is what I'm advising. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, uh, so you're gonna have to make it. So, I've, uh, got, I've got a lot of calls waiting, so please make it quick. Yeah. So, uh, so like, uh, uh, so should I? Uh, I think I should should be contacting you. So, like, uh, I think you can take up my case. Is that? Well, right now there's nothing to take up. You are welcome to call me. I'm gonna tell you the same thing after charging you a consultation. You want to pay and discuss this matter further, that's fine. But what I'm telling you is, it's important to find out whether you have a fraud finding against you or not. And how to, how to, how to find that thing? I just explained it to you, sir, twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just B1, B2, right? That's right. And if, you, if you're not ready to apply for B1, B2, you can just send an email to the counselor yeah. saying that I'm confused. Is this finding against me or the company? Please clarify. Okay, so send an email to the consulate. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, all right. Good luck. Okay, I'll do that thing. And if it comes, so if they kind of come back to me and they tell me like it is against you, then I come back to you. You right? have to. Yeah, because you're not going to be able to resolve it yourself. This will need some serious muscle. Okay. Okay, all right. Yeah, good, thank good, you, Rajiv. Good luck, good luck. And my email is help at immigration.com. Sure, sure. I'll do that. All right. Good luck. Thanks. Okay. Let's go to Minnesota. Minnesota, go ahead, please. Minnesota. Minnesota, go ahead, please. Okay. I guess not. I'm going to close that. Let's go on to... The next frequently asked question. Yeah, this is also a very common problem. You come to the airport, you are given an I-94, which is for a duration less than what was given to you originally in your petition approval. So let's say you have an H-1, which was good till August, and you came to the airport in January, and they gave you a, an I-94 good only till June because your passport was expiring in June, okay? In that case, what do you do? Well, you have two options. If your passport has been renewed and your visa is still good, you can go outside and come back using the approval notice and the visa on your passport. You should be given the entire time remaining on your petition plus 10 days usually. That is one option. Second option is if you have still time on the I-94 that was given to you at the airport, you can apply for an extension uh, while you are within the United States, but that's like filing an H-1 all over again. I see that Minnesota has raised their hand again. Um, I'll try to get to you. I guess it's about the previous question. But anybody has a follow-up question on this? How to extend my I-94? Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. I, this, this was also being asked by Nick that if I change job with the same employer, does H-1 amendment take care of the I-94? The answer is yes. You can combine an amendment with an extension, a transfer with an extension. So no, you can just go get a visa stamping, or if you have a visa, just go outside USA, come back using the valid visa and the existing approval notice, and you should be able to get I-94 all the way to the approval notice. Uh, let me, I don't think there's any follow-up question on this. Let me go to Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, go ahead. Well, there's a follow-up question from New Jersey. Let me go to Minnesota first. Guys, please stay alert. Uh, yeah, Minnesota, go ahead. Hello, Rajaji. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, um, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, I just have a, a question regarding the previous uh, previous one. Fraud, and mis um, fraud or misrepresentation, right? Yes, sir. Uh, um, actually, uh, my wife's employer has committed some fraud 
um the, uh, and uh, he was put in jail for uh, and uh, he was in, in bail right now but um, and uh, my my wife's green card is filed from that company and uh, her one party is approved for more than 180 days um she, um they say that there is no risk for her it's only on a uh, case is only on on the employer not no, no, no there is no, be no risk for the employee working in the company no um, who said so that want to know who, 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 who said this for her sir who said that is that the employer who said that yeah no i i i won't take their word for it because think about it if there is fraud in any dealing with immigration immigration can make that an issue and reopen any number of cases claiming that one fraud puts into doubt all the immigration filings i have dealt with this issue one smart thing sir uh, this is uh, regarding some jobs uh, they have uh, uh, made some cash uh, transactions for it, for one job which they were caught for not regarding the immigration ah oh, then um, then I, i i don't think that should be a problem i i i'm making a guess but you would be still well advised to get together with your employer talk with a lawyer uh including your employer in the conversation just to make sure that your i140 is reasonably safe nobody can guarantee it but at least get some sense from a lawyer whether this i140 can be revoked for fraud or misrepresentation it doesn't look like it if it is an unrelated problem it shouldn't be an issue but i can't really tell you without knowing more so if they have a company lawyer that you've used before and you are comfortable with ask them okay yeah yeah yes sir. there is one more situation has come up like uh, what happened is um, uh, my wife when she was initially you know, Uh, in that company for two months on the in-house project, and she moved to a different client after that. Uh, last year, what happened is uh, uh, there was an USCIS inspection uh, when they came and uh, checked for her, and she is not there at the particular location. And um, now they have sent a notice to revoke her uh, um, uh, her petition, and uh, they are filing, uh, giving all the documents. Uh, including all the receipts they which she spent over there or the grocery receipts and every document they are hunting and giving it to the uh, USCIS for for their uh, verification proving that she is employed and that she is currently working in a different location for different client um and all these situations came at this time and uh, um we don't know how to proceed I think you definitely you definitely need your papers reviewed. Get together with somebody who either knows the case or somebody you want to consult with. I would I think if the lawyers are good ethical lawyers, you can talk with the lawyers that you're already working with. Ask them what they say. Explain to them the whole situation. Look, if there are so many ways to deal with these kind of situations as long as they are being dealt with honestly. if you are playing games with the government or i am playing games with the government that's not a good thing uh, we want to do everything by the book and there are certain things we can take on and and win and certain things we will find it difficult to explain if there is no good faith so it's really a very subjective fact bound determination i can't give you a generic rule that will apply in your case but what i can tell you is it can be serious don't take any chance with this make sure you talk with your lawyers okay okay sir thank you so much you're welcome okay we have another i guess follow up question from new jersey yes new jersey go ahead please hello sir ji i just you know i'm so, sorry i'm late i just joined this uh, uh question regarding the actual i need to call extension So, uh, look, I, I'm not going to repeat. I'm not going to repeat the answers. I could be going back time and time again. Um, it's I, don't do that, please. This is you. You just there's many people on the phone. You're taking their time. You're taking my time. That's not fair. Just listen to the recording. I have given you the explanation. I'll try to get the recording up by tomorrow afternoon, so you can listen to the recording. But the bottom line is, again, you know, I am kind of stuck with being who I am. I guess. 
I'll just tell you this. I-94 can be extended. If you have not fallen out of status, you can go outside USA, come back with the visa stamping you have, approval notice, as well as the new passport. You should be given an I-94, which is good for the entire duration of the approval. You can also combine an amendment with an extension or a transfer with an extension. Okay, I'm not going to answer any follow-up questions now. Good luck to you. Okay, guys, please log on on time. That's just not fair. Uh, next question, frequently asked question. Then we go to, let's see. Oh, this is uh, another interesting question. And this has come up many times before. How long can a U.S. citizen stay outside the USA? As long as you like. There was a time many, many years ago when there was a restriction. Now, you could stay outside for 30 years, never come to USA. You're still a U.S. citizen. Green card holders don't have that benefit, but citizens do. Now, you asked me some questions, Sunny, about OCI card. I don't practice Indian laws anymore. Many, many years ago, I used to be a lawyer in India. I do not know what the Indian laws are. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, star 5. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this. Okay. Let's go on to... Okay, that was all the frequently asked questions. Now, let me go to the questions that are not frequently asked questions. Let's see. These are all... Now, this is for EB-5. Jane US 99. How can we get green card more quickly? EB-5. Well, EB-5 is not a great category either. Because the first form that we file itself, the adjudication is taking close to two years, 19, 18, 19 months. I think they're doing like September 2015 right now. Two years after that, you have to apply for the removal of the condition on your conditional green card, which is what you will get. So first you will get the I-526 approval. Then you will go through either consular processing or 485. You can't combine the two. You can't file 485 and 526 together. 485 gets approved, you get conditional green card. After two years, you have to apply 90 days before two years are over. You have to apply for removal of conditional status. And that form itself takes about two years. So it's, it's really a fairly long process. It's shorter than what India-born people are facing right now under EB2 or EB3, but you do have to invest money and the money remains invested for the next three, four years, okay? Next question is, I am on H1B, eighth year, I-140 is approved in 2013. Can I start a business in USA? No, I think that's a problem. If you are, if you are, engaged in active investment, which means you put money and then you follow that money with work and you create money for yourself. That I think is unauthorized employment without a doubt. So no, if you on the other hand, put money in the stock market and don't touch it, passive investment I think is fine. Is there any major change with green card and H1B process after thump came? I think you mean Trump. Thump is accurate enough though. Major change with green card and H-1B process, now that can take a long time for me to answer. If you go to immigration.com and go to my blogs, all the recent changes are documented there. So there's nothing here that should affect individuals right now. But in the long run, we'll see how it goes. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, star 5. Okay. Next question is from KVPBSI. I'm working with employer A, EB2 approved I-140 priority date 2009, waiting for the dates to become current. Planning to move to employer B, want to avoid risk. 
because I'm so close to the priority date. I know that H1B premium is not there anymore. So can I stay back with my old employer, whether or not the transfer is approved, rejected? We discussed that issue today. Um, I have a question from Minnesota. Guys, please be alert. I don't like to keep going back to the same questions. Okay, go ahead, sir. Hello, yeah, go ahead. Hello, Ajit. My quick question is, I know you posted something about the computer programmers on your blog, but I just wanted to let you elaborate a little bit about the uh, recent memo about the computer programmers. About the programmers, that memorandum? Um, actually, yes. I, I did a very, I think a fairly detailed radio show conversation on that yesterday. One second. I'll post that between today and tomorrow. If you still have questions, uh, just feel free to drop me a line, okay? But the bottom line, I'll, I'll give you a quick summary. The quick summary is, they haven't changed much of the law. It was always like this. The job title of a programmer is questionable whether or not a degree is required. So we'll have to prove it that a degree is required for this and a specific degree. Government simply said, don't rely upon Department of Labor data to prove it. Each case is going to be treated differently. And if you are a level one programmer, it will be very difficult for you to prove that you require a bachelor's degree. So one, prove it. Two, if you're a level one, it might be impossible. Got it? Good luck. Thank you. Okay, so going back to Okay, nobody had any question on that. Let's go to or back to KVPBSI, which was I-140 got approved, want to minimize risk. So can I stay back with the old employer if the subsequent H-1 is approved? And we've had a very lengthy discussion on this issue today. So the answer is, sure, why not? Can I finish my, uh, my green card with employer A, then move to employer B? Sure. And we have a very lengthy discussion again in the frequently asked questions about how long should I stay with an employer after my green card is approved. So review the frequently asked questions. I think it's a blog entry also. I also discussed how you can renew the h 4 ad as long as you have one I-140 approved. You can, and it doesn't matter which employer, you can get the h 4 ad um, approved as well as extended. For H-1B transfer, do the job description have to be the same? No, not at all. And the rest of the questions are already addressed. So I think it's a good idea for you to stick with the employer A if you're so close to the end. Um, after 180 days of 485 filing, you could use AC-21 and move to a same or similar job with any employer. That is fairly safe, but have it reviewed by a lawyer make sure that the jobs are same or similar. That's where same or similar comes in, when you do a green card portability. When you're just doing I-140 through another employer, another firm, they can be totally different jobs. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, star five, okay. Let's go to, uh, this is California. California, go ahead, please. Rajagi, Rajagi here. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to get to here is um, because my current, uh, the priority is so close, what I was hoping to do is with a new employer, have them file uh, labor and H-1B transfer at the same time so so that I, my, my goal is not to move to the new company even the H-1B transfer is approved. I want to wait until labor gets approved and the one party gets approved with a new company, that way I will be in the current date with a new company. Is that doable? Uh, yes, it is. So the idea is I am going to join the new company only after I-140 approval because my priority date is now ported over. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Right. That can be that can be done. Uh, also, the jobs don't have to be same or similar because what you are porting is the priority date. It can be a totally different job. The only thing you've got to watch out for is that the new employer 
has got the money to pay you. So let, tell your lawyers right. to look into the ability to pay wages issue. Otherwise, no problem. Okay. So yeah. So I just, so basically, there is no problem. I'm, I can wait until 140 days, right? That and is, then that is correct. I can quote my date. Yes, sir. Doing 485. Yes, sir. Will. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, let's go on to the next non frequently asked question. This one is from Lisa Hernandez. My husband is a green card holder with no conditions. Um, they are. She's got people who are being detained because of domestic assaults. Well, Lisa, first of all, unless there is an actual conviction, just because somebody was accused of domestic assault doesn't make any difference if the charges were dismissed. Now, if the charges were dismissed with certain conditions, for example, there was actually a guilt finding, and this can be tricky. If there was actually a trial and some kind of, a, or if not even a trial, some kind of a pre-trial proceeding, such as anger management, that could be a problem. Have it reviewed by a lawyer locally in the state where the assault occurred. Have it reviewed there. Preferably by a lawyer who does immigration court work because they would know what to look for. But just because charges were filed doesn't mean anything. Star five, if you have a question, star five. So you don't need to worry unless there was actually a conviction or some kind of a pre-trial diversion of some kind, okay? Amit Tyagi, priority date is 2014 in EB2. It will take another 15 years to get green card. Oh my God. My daughter is nine on H4. Yeah, you can do an F1 change of status within USA. A lot of people are doing it because green cards are taking so long. Second question. So she can convert to an F1 within USA. After my wife got h 4 ad we started a business that will make half a million dollars and apply for EB-5. They might improve. See, right now the regulations are still pending. Whether they are going to increase the limit to 1.35 million, we don't really know. My question is, if we start any business here in the US and get to 1.35 million, not a profit, but the revenue of 1.35 million, can we still apply for EB-5 category? Probably not. The way this works is, you are starting a business or investing in a business based upon money that you have made. So you have to invest your capital. That capital can be gift, your own money, or even money borrowed against your personal assets. But it can't be just because you have brought a business up to 1.35 million uh, revenue, you can get a green card under EB-5. That's not how it works. I hope I answered your question, Amiji. I think I did. Star 5, if there's a follow-up follow -up question on this, star 5. Okay. Let's go to... Florida, a cell phone from Florida. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, that is in other states. Uh, yes. This is a myth. Yes. So, uh, uh, is this all, all this, like uh, half a million, supposed to come out from outside USA? Or no, no. Can, uh, generate it, here? no it, it can come from within USA as long as it is tax paid money. Uh, for instance, if you've been saving money or you made money in business or even if you won a lottery, that's your money. Absolutely. Okay. No problem. Yeah, it can come from within so US. Okay. So suppose if I have like a investor friend and he said, okay, like I can invest. Uh, no. Let's say like a let us buy no. a gas ticket together. No, no, no. that okay. doesn't. It doesn't work like that. It has to be your money. Somebody can gift it to you. Gift has, you know, remember for gift they have to pay gift tax on it. Somebody can gift you money, but oh. it has to be your money. Just because your friend says I'll invest one million for you. It, by the way, if you have friends like that, I would like to meet them. Um, I need friends like that. Uh, so, you know, um, if if I'm trying to think of any way this could, yeah, a gift or loan based upon your personal assets being leveraged, 
that would be the only way you could do this and also by the way remember money can come from different sources combined so you got 200000 as a gift from dad you got 600000 in your savings uh, you can combine all of that and you borrowed let's say 400000 against your property in calcutta now uh, you can do all of that combined okay so we need to show all the legitimate sources So that money, like it cannot be uh, yes. like undocumented money. Yeah, they are very, okay. very, they are very okay. concerned about EB-5 being used as a money laundering scheme. So no, the source of funds must be quite clearly established. Okay, and I think what is it like? How much percentage people are uh, getting uh, this in this category? Like if hundred people apply, normally like ten, fifteen people get it, or like percentage uh, higher? Look, I don't know about other people, but all the cases that we have filed have gone through uh, the only case that got stuck was the one that i'm dealing with right now why it got stuck was that was based upon a business that was going to use oil you know natural oil oil and gas uh-huh, they were yeah. going to use yeah. oil and the prices of oil fell drastically after we filed the case so government came back and said Uh, we can't approve this case because all your predictions and your models are wrong so that can happen if your business depends upon something and the bottom falls out of that that something um, you could have a problem but normally going in we know if this is going to go through or not okay okay, okay. so okay. thank you so much raj we really appreciate you have a nice day you're welcome thank you too, sir bye bye Okay uh the next one is from Jini I have my EAD since 2015 changed employers in Jan 2016 AC 21 portability requirement July 2016 when there was an RFP I'm changing employers again should I go ahead and send a supplement J yes uh I my reading of the regulations is that you have to submit a supplement j if you change jobs after january 17th some of the lawyers think that you can wait till the rfe i don't think so do multiple job portability is effect 45 no you can file j uh, supplement j every time you move and you can move 30 times if you want i don't think that's a problem start five if you have a question start five okay Next question is from D K Doshi. Oh wait, let me just make sure I covered everything. Because I had combined two questions somewhere. I'm just trying to make sure I didn't miss something. Oh yeah, here is the combination. Oh, but I already talked with them. I already talked with them. Okay, this one is out. So let's go back to. And take it though she says my spouse has a temporary conditional green card based on marriage she got it extended for another year without filing jointly so he wants to know if i can revoke her petition and so i don't really think so because remember for a marriage based green card what is required is that marriage when entered into was entered in good faith if later on things did not work out that does not mean you can cancel or revoke the green card and can you inform uscis you can certainly write them a letter and even maybe an affidavit um you don't have a you don't have any say on its renewal no you don't unless there is some kind of a fraud can you know the current status of petition no she is protected by privacy laws what are documents i can object to if they are used without my consent I can't think of anything ex- except if there is some fraud. If the marriage was entered into good faith, whether she uses your marriage marriage invitation card or uses pictures from your marriage, I don't think you can stop her. Star five, if you have a follow up question. Star five. Okay. Let's go to Mr. Doshi. Mr. Doshi, go ahead. You did. Yes. Hi, Rajiv. Uh, just a quick follow-up. If I have to write a letter, I mean, what should I write, or where, where can I send it? 
Um, normally what I do, uh, normally what I do, oh, there's a lot of echo on the line. There's a lot of echo. Let me put you on presentation. Let me put you on presentation. Okay, I just muted you for a second because there was a lot of echo, some kind of a feedback going on. I had a case like this recently in which there was a lot of problems because the guy had misrepresented, he had not told my client, his wife, that he had actually a criminal background. So there was all sorts of things that were going wrong. So what I did was, and he was actually, he had a case in which they had uh, made some kind of a compromise with the government. So I wrote to the U.S. Attorney's Office, I wrote to ICE, I wrote to USCIS, because if he ever files for condition, remove, to rem removal of condition, they, were, they should take into consideration that letter. And I also wrote ICE, I wrote to U.S. Attorney's Office, USCIS, and that's it. So the same letter basically. Those are the four things that I can recommend, or the three things I can recommend. Go ahead if you have any questions, I just unmuted you. Muted. Unmuted. Okay, so email or a letter, I mean, posting the letter is, is good enough, at least to inform that we are no longer together. I don't see any problem with that. Okay. Muted. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Then, the next question is, Vipul, my employment was terminated in February this year. I had timely filed an H-4 chain of status before the last day at my previous employer. Now, filing has two meanings. Under immigration law, filing occurs when USCIS actually physically receives the papers with the proper fees. So if you file today, means you send it out today, that's not filing. If they receive it tomorrow, that's filing. Okay. So let's get that clear. I recently, oh, okay. So the question is, if somebody files for my H1, can I start working on AC21? The answer is no. In order for you to work on receipt basis, you've got to have proper H1 status. If you are in between statuses, you've got H4 applied for, you cannot start working. Okay. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Actually, you, there's another follow-up question. I'll get that. Can I ask for expedited processing? Yes. Premium processing is closed, but there's what, five or seven reasons based upon which including uh, extraordinary financial loss, etc. You can try to ask them. They might, they might extend it or they might not. Uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. They might expedite it or they might not. But it's worth asking. You could. Let me get to your question first. Let's go to. Okay, I. You must be a voiceover IP. I can't see your phone number. Go ahead, please. Um, hello, Rajiv ji, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, so I did receive uh, the receipt from USCIS before the last day uh, of my employment. So it oh, was kindly filed the change of status. Good, good. Um, now the fault is, uh, the, the, uh, the law firm, what they're citing is, they're citing the 60-day rule. Uh, because I'm in between status and I don't have my H-4 confirmed, uh, what they're saying is, uh, considering the 60-day extension period, which expires this April 11th, in my case, uh, they are filing for a change of employer petition, uh, citing that the last status that I maintained in U.S. was H-1B, um, and they're going to be withdrawing my H-4 extension application um, as part of that um, petition. I agree with them. If they are going to use the grace period rule, the grace period rule does say, that if you get another H1 file within the 60 days, you can start working after the filing, the receipt. So yes, I agree with that. Okay, so uh, that shouldn't be an issue. The only only challenge is uh, I may not I may not get the receipt, the actual physical receipt from USCIS before the 11th April. Um, would that be treated as illegal stay in the US? No, no. As long as the papers are received by the USCIS. 
Okay, gotcha. Good luck. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. There's another question from New Jersey. Okay. New Jersey, go ahead, please. Hey, Rabbi, sir. Uh, I have a question, but uh, can you hear me? I, I'm not doing new questions today. Unless you have a follow-up, I won't be able to answer it. Sorry. Okay. Um, there's another one from New Jersey. New Jersey, go ahead. You have a follow-up? Yeah, and the question is the same thing. That okay, we can do the H1. Uh, the guy can start working on the H1B for the H1B amendment. I should say, uh, can he start working on the receipt notice, or or just a courier notice is good enough? Courier yeah. receipt number is fine. Or this is a this number? is a very difficult question to answer. Give me one second. I'm just looking at my tweets also. Okay. This is a very difficult question to answer. When you look at the language of the law, it uses the word receipt. Now, receipt is a word in English. It's a word in accounting. Which one do they mean? Do they mean receipt as in the paper document or do they mean receipt as in the physical receipt of the paperwork? The more cautious conservative lawyers like me, we tend to say that it should be physical receipt. Uh, let me rephrase that. The paper receipt issued by the USCIS but I think if you wanted to be aggressive, you could be. Just bear in mind that this issue is far from clear. Okay? Right. Yeah, but you said that as long as the paper is received in their office. I didn't say that. I said it's not clear. Sir, I, you can't make, make <laughs> change my words. I said, I don't know. It's, this is not clear. This is something nobody really knows, whether it's physical receipt or, uh, or the paper receipt. So receipt means when I send you something, you received it. You are in receipt of what I sent you. It also means the paper you send me saying I have received your paperwork. Okay. So it's up to your lawyers and your employers. I don't have a particular preference in this. If you want to be conservative, stick with my opinion. Wait for the receipt. Okay. Next, let's see. All right, let's see. This is the question about uh, TDTN for Canadian citizens. Boyfriend for the past eight years, we are common law partners. By the way, I'm not sure what the law in your particular province in Canada is. You may want to check. If you are considered to be married under the provincial laws, you can certainly make a case you're already married because if the marriage is recognized in Canada, it should be recognized in USA as well. Can we get married in USA then fly to the nearest border to get TN? See, I don't like the idea of coming in on a tourist visa to get married. I think there are some issues there. It's better to get married in Canada. You've been living, uh, you came to US about three months ago. If you did not enter with the intention to get married, I think it's okay to get married. If your intention changed. Okay, but then also there's a question. When you entered USA, uh, are you here? Press star five. I have a couple of questions for you. Press star five if you are here. Okay, I guess not. I would have liked to know. Oh yeah, you are here. Excellent. So let me ask you this question. When you, when you were at the airport or at the border coming into USA, did they ask you why you were going to USA? Uh, they, hi, Rajiv. Yeah? Uh, yeah, they asked her right. uh, why, they were, why she was coming. And she said that she was coming to visit me. Uh, me as and, in? And that was it. Me, me as in my fiance, my boyfriend. My friend. Oh, my boyfriend. Oh, that's very good. If she declared the fact that she's coming in to see her boyfriend, and three months into her stay here, you change your mind and you want to get married, hey, go for it. I don't see any problem. Okay, perfect. And uh, okay, 
Okay, so th- there is no need for us. So, so we can get married here and then uh, and then fly to the border, or still you can, or you can, Canada. you can even apply for change of status to TD within USA. Oh, okay. So, so we don't even have to go to the border. First. Not if you don't want to. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. All right. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Next question is Nick H1B. Wow, there's still a bunch of questions left. Uh, tenth year, I-140 approved. Suppose I move back to India and I want to come back to USA with a different employer. Does this new H1B with different employer is it exempt from quota? Yes. If your H-1B was approved in the last six years, you're exempt from quota. And you have time because you have an I-140 approved, so you could apply for a three-year extension. I have to move to India for at least six months to a year. Excuse me, I'm having some allergies. Uh, let me put this on pause. Okay, so I want H1B, I want 40 years approved in January. My H1B six years will expire in July. If I take advantage of the 180 day rule and resign from my job, I would have completed six years almost. Can I come back six to nine months? Sure, sure. Because if your I 140 was approved, and it stayed approved for 180 days, you can then come back with any employer using that I-140 as the basis for H-1 extension. Does the new rule give me the freedom to move back and work in USA without having to file for a new H-1B? Yeah, you would not be subject to the quota for six years from the date of your last H-1 approval. And I think even after that, there's some argument to be made that you would not be subject to the quota since you are looking for what is called the remainder option. I'm not sure how it, it would fly after six, six years, but if you get an H1 approval again in one, two, three, four years, then that H1 has been approved and six more years are safe. So really there are two issues. When am I subject to the quota? Six years after approval. When do I, how, how long can I get my extensions? As long, as long as you've got an I-140 approved and it stayed approved for 180 days on or after January 17th. I think you've got it. Star five if you have a follow-up question on this. Star five if you have a follow-up question on this. Okay. Next question is from Hemant. Oh. There's a follow-up question. All right, sir, go ahead, New Jersey, go ahead. Yes, sir. So, uh, my initial question uh, was like, I moved back to India already, and I'm trying to apply from India on a new H-1B okay. with a different employer. Okay. That was me. Okay, yeah, you, you, I, can. I have you can. I don't see why not. Okay. I don't see why not. I don't see any problem. Yeah, I don't see any any quota issue here. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Uh, now this is Hemanji. I have an H1B approved till 21st September from 2017 to employer A. I140 is approved in EB1 from employer A. That's very good which is current now, applying for I-485 or council processing outside USA. I'm in India, laid off from employer A. So if you are an EB-1A, the layoff doesn't matter. But if you're an EB-1B, then you've got a problem. You apply for a B-1 tourist visa based upon daughter working in USA. I provided I-140 approval by employer A and will provide future employment letter. Can I apply for 45 if I come to USA on B1? No. Don't do that. I think I think that could be a ground for denial. It's an inappropriate use of B1 visa. I don't think you should do that. 
Should I do constant processing with new employer B? See, I don't know, sir, whether you are EB1A or EB1B. If you are extraordinary ability alien, you don't even need a job offer. Okay. Which one is less risk? Consular processing is less risk. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question. Star 5. Okay. No, no follow. Next question is Desi Ruben. Oh, there is a follow-up question. This is from Florida. Florida, go ahead, please. Florida. Florida. That is Himan. Yes, Himan. Yeah, hi. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so my question is that uh, you are saying that I cannot, I should not do come on B one and apply for four. I don't think so. That's no, what you are saying. Correct. Yes, so I should not. Yes. Sir. So, so now you are, but but can I come over there and? Uh, back come on to to US and uh, find a new employer and can they do a H1 transfer and uh, to me or, 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 or the best option is to do a counselor processing start in India? What I would your, start uh, I would start a counselor processing and you know finish it as counselor processing. You are EB one A or EB one B? Uh, let me let me let me I'm let me sure ask you: that. extraordinary ability alien or outstanding researcher or professor? Extra, extra something. Uh, you have to confirm that because very different laws for both. If it is extraordinary ability alien, okay. you yes. don't need an employment. You should finish your council passing, then come. Okay. Okay, and and. Will that take uh, six to eight months, or, or uh, that, that can that can easily easily take up to a year, but whatever time it takes, it takes. There's no way to make it any quicker than that. Okay. Okay. And okay, so you are saying uh, going with that is and and meanwhile I can so after I apply for a company, I can I can still travel on that even visa to US and come back and all that. Correct. And that is up to the CBP. I did not say that. Um, CBP can refuse you entry because you have a green card going. Normally they won't, but there's no guarantee. It is within their rights to refuse you entry. Okay? Yeah. So you are saying if. if Sir, I have to really, I have to move along. Can you can you just wrap it up really quickly because I have other questions still, and I'm already half hour half hour yeah. over the time. So make it really quick. I'll answer one more question for you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just saying that in that case, I, I, I should not travel on a B1 after applying for a counselor. I, I prefer I not to. If you travel, be prepared to be turned back at the airport. Okay. They may not do that, but that risk is there. Okay. All right, sir, I, I've got to go on. Good luck. This is from Desi Ruben who says, I'm a permanent resident, applied for citizenship. How soon can I start immigration for my parents? As soon as you get sworn in, you'll get your naturalization certificate. You can apply for them. In the meantime, what you can do is you can prepare the paperwork, have the paperwork ready. So the moment you get sworn in, you get your naturalization certificate, you apply for it. Your sister who's physically disabled may be able to join them on a B1, B2 visa. But she will not be able to join them directly because when you apply for her, she comes under family based preference category five, which is 13, 14 years backed up. You can apply for it, but that might cause problems with her B1, B2. I think she might do better with a B1, B2 rather than a, a, a green card directly. But it's difficult for me to make that call. Star five, if you're here, star five. New York, go ahead, please. New York. Hey, Diwali, thanks. Thanks for taking this call. Sure. So my question is, if she cannot join uh, as a dependent, is that what you're saying? Yeah, the way it works is, when you apply for your parents, they come under a category called immediate relatives. The upside of immediate relatives is, they get their green card without waiting for priority dates. The downside is none of their dependents get a green card with them. Each one has to be applied for separately. In fact, even mother and father have to be applied for separately. 
So one case for mother, one for father. And once they come here, they can apply for your unmarried sister. But that will take whatever time it takes, four, five, six years. So you cannot combine all of them in one green card package. Okay. So there is no way that you can also join them, even if it's a different B1, B1, B2 visa, you can request a tourist visa and ex request extensions because there's nobody to take care of her in in, uh, in India. And I have a bunch of frequently asked questions on that. Please go over our FAQ. You should be able to pull out that information. Okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay. I think this is the last question coming up. We went almost an hour over my allocated time. No, no, actually 20 minutes. That's not bad. Uh, last question is, Baldwin 3, in 2007, my parents applied for employment-based 485. I was in eighth grade on H4 status, which was denied due to late receipt of I-140. 2008, they started the process again. Paperwork. So a week ago, my parents received their green card. What are my options now? So are you over 21? Are you here? Uh, press star 5 if you are here. Press star 5. So if you are in 8th grade in 2007, that means you're about 13 years old. So you're definitely over 21 now. Yeah, you're 23 years old. It says so. Okay. Can my parents apply now for me since I was included in the earlier file? I don't think so. I don't think so. The only time you can deduct from your age under Child Status Protection Act is the time the I-140 stayed pending. So if it stayed pending for only three months, you are considered to be three months less than 23, which is still 21. Can they file I-130? Yes. If you are unmarried, they can file I-130. I I I'm on OPT EAD. I would apply for your green card and move on to H1. And if you have an option to apply through your work eventually, do that also because you can have a green card going through more than one category. But I'm a little, little, little hesitant to apply when you are on F1. Um, I would rather wait till you get your H1 then apply. That would be my suggestion. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, star 5. Okay, very well, folks. As always, I am very glad, very happy to talk with all of you. In two weeks, we'll speak again. Sorry, we just don't have enough time these days to take up new questions because there are so many questions posted already. Uh, we'll talk again in two weeks. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time. And, um, you know, it's instantaneous. It happens right away. And post your questions beforehand. Or you can just log in. Uh, the phone number in all are provided, 202-800-8394-1230. Eastern Standard Time every other Thursday. We have uh, free apps for both Apple iOS platform for your iPhones and iPads as well as for Android. Just look for immigration.com, immigration.com, the period dot, and uh, the application should show up.